Okay, my friends, welcome to video number three in the series. I'm going through the book, Why Nations Fail. As a quick review, if it's been a second since you listened to the previous two videos, remember the ideas, right? And we're talking about was Jared Diamond's theories about, you know, geography, about nitrogen in the soil, about beasts of burden being available. Are these sufficient to explain why certain nations do well and certain don't? Other ones don't. Um, you know, he talked about, look, there was a time when uh, the Incans, they had access to the European animals, the horses and things like this. Um, there's ideas that, well, maybe it has something to do with uh, values that are held by certain nations, that there's like this inherent virtue that causes nations to do well. And they say, well, you know, no, not necessarily. You can't ascribe it to a religion anyways. I mean, uh, Japan did very well. Uh, China modernized, um, you know. These are not, uh, these are not like British, you know, Anglo uh, societies with those, say like Christian values, if you want to call them that. But um, remember then they move into this idea of exclusive versus inclusive governments, societies, basically uh, where you're going to run into a lot of problems if you centralize all the power among uh, an elite. An elite is a general term. It could be a political elite. It could be a military dictatorship or, an arm, you know, a country ruled by an army. Um, it could be a corporate elite where, you know, basically all the goods, maybe like we were talking about Peru, where the government said, okay, listen, we don't want to tax the land. That's too difficult to do. What we'll do is we'll build railroads and we'll cause everyone to force everyone to use our railroads in order to export their goods from the highlands. And we'll just put a tax on that. You know, there's a lot of different ways. Basically, what I'm saying is that you can concentrate power among elites. It doesn't have to be a certain system. We even saw that it doesn't have to be like a Marxist versus, say, um, democratic systems, right? Maybe democratic in name type systems like we saw in Colombia. Um, it really matters more of, of how people are treated. Uh, equity, protection of property, uh, access to justice, um, incentives to, uh, you know, sell your labor at a competitive rate. These are the things we're talking about. And these authors in this book really argue that it's these other types of things, not, not animals, not really essentially even technological advances. They're arguing you have to have an, an environment where technological advances can take place, where people have an honest shot at being rewarded for their entrepreneurial risk taking. That's the essential idea. Um, if things get really bad, so if things get really good, you can have the virtuous circle, which means you um, kind of build innovation one after the other, after the other, after the other. And you can see that in different even parts of the same country. They talked about the South, had a huge cotton industry, maybe all the people in the South, they made one new patent per year in cotton, related to cotton. That's crazy, right? So, um, you know, it can matter a lot. And even as changes are made in the Constitution, which we saw in the last section, as the Americans outlawed slavery outright, the basically Southern elites said, okay, we can still maintain our old system within this new legal framework. No problem. We'll, we'll figure out, we can figure out a way to do it. And that's what they did. So uh, just the changing of laws doesn't necessitate a change of this distribution of power that we're looking at as we go through these chapters. So chapter 14, that leads us up to chapter 14. Um, well, let me say one other thing. You can also have a very, very bad situation where you're cho you have to choose between um, an extractive society where basically a few people in power run everything, kind of maybe heavy handed. Um, versus a failed state. A failed state is the worst of the worst in this book. Employment, unemployment is high as 94%, mass violence, no utilities. Um, and in fact, in some cases, we saw uh, someone Stevens in Africa actually destroy the railroad system that was already built and in place in order to secure and maintain more power. We also saw people got um, overthrown by neighboring uh, basically rebels because they were so afraid of their own people they were so afraid of their own armies becoming strong that they kept their own armies weak. And when an opposing force from a different country came in, uh, we're talking like Sierra Leone um, and uh, Liberia, one of these two, I can't remember. But <clears throat> there was no power. There's no power in the army. So you could see all the manipulation that has to happen, things like this. Chapter 14, other examples that have been able to, make the, been able to break the mold, break the mold of um, basically exclusive societies. One, they say that you know, violence can can be one of those things. They also said in the last section, technology can be one of those things. Um, they said disease can be one of those big things. Anything that at a ground level uh, fundamentally challenges the way things are done, 
that could be something. So they don't like poopa all, you know, armed rebellions. They don't. You know, they say that this can be a stepping stone in in the course of, I mean, basically getting to an equal or more equal society. All right, so other examples that have been able to break the mold. You had the three African chiefs that were talked about. Uh, on 1895, there were three African chiefs who came to England and took the train to London. Uh, they were there to save the, the people from Cecil Rhodes, and this is in Rhodesia, um, after which the country was named uh, Cecil Rhodes, so Rhodesia. And so these chiefs, this is in the area of what would become Botswana. That's where they're from. David Livingston converted one of the kings to Christ, and the first Bible was translated into this African language. Now, uh, the British make it a protectorate because they wanted to push back against the Boers and the German colonists, but the British didn't think that full war would be necessary. Things changed as Cecil Rhodes started expanding. The year of the three chiefs was now under consideration. The chiefs knew that they could not defeat him militarily, and they knew he would enslave them. So they asked the missionaries to help them. So the missionaries then spoke with Joseph Chamberlain and Queen Elizabeth. Well, Chamberlain said that he would consider opposing Rhodes. Well, then the chiefs went on a speaking tour in order to publicize their cause. Rhodes was, repre was preparing for uh, the Jameson raid, which Chamberlain opposed. So the chiefs make an agreement with Chamberlain. He wanted to give each tribe a country with an officer. And Rhodes was very upset that he was outmaneuvered by the chiefs. I bet he was. Well, in the end, the chiefs were successful in avoiding the rule of Rhodes. Since the early stages of colonization was a big deal, to be able to avoid this would be important. So, at independence, Botswana was one of the poorest, and they were surrounded by countries that hated the idea of a country run by blacks. But today, they have the highest per, ap per capita income in Sub-Saharan Africa, similar to Estonia. It holds regular and fair elections, has avoided civil war, and has set up private property. Very interesting example. So this was all, think about Botswana. That's what we were talking about, Botswana. The story of the three chiefs. Very interesting story. Moving on, England has the Tudors. They have the Magna Carta. They believed in property rights. Well, also Botswana had some level of pluralism. Elites owned the cattle, even though the land was communal. The chiefs were tired. Oh, they were, sorry, the chiefs were trying to hide the diamond mining. So they set a law that set, sent the value of diamonds to go to education and other things for the state and the public good. Now, Karetse Koma did the Subsoil Act and other acts that led to putting power in a central government and restricting some of the tribe's power. They also limited the languages down to just two, Setswana and English. They stopped asking about ethnicity and they assumed everyone was from Swana. The diamonds that became high revenue in the 1970s uh, helped them, I suppose, yes. But the big point of the, this section was that the, the leaders insisted on inclusivity, on inclusive institutions, that the diamond mining was going to be uh, something that was shared, the revenues and the benefits were shared by most most of the people, if not all. Now, some of the changes in the black migration to the north, you had the NAACP, we're speaking of in the United States, the introduction of machines, the fact that southern elites did not have enough power as they were subject to federal government. Uh, and I said, well, I mean, they did still keep segregation for a long time. But you had black students getting into universities. There was, of course, riots. There was the tear gas. There was the dogs, the, the water, um, you know, the water cannons. Federal troops were brought into Oxford. Strom Thurmond ran for president, carried four states and 35-ish electoral votes. He would later filibuster against the civil rights movement, but did not work. Then we have the rebirth of China. Chiang Kai-shek of the Nationalists was overthrown by Mao Zedong by the PCC, the People's Communist Party. Since then, no one has been able to do another political party. That's, there's only one available. Now, Mao actually died in 1972. He abolished national property rights. He executed his political enemies. He got rid of money and made work. The idea of work, the point of work is what this is saying. He made work 
you know, an idea that it's, we do this in order to exchange for goods. You know, we, we work for basically material gain. Um, everything was nationalized and pushed on five-year plans he copied from the Soviet Union in order to focus on heavy industry and economic growth. Now, the Chinese Communist Party had a monopoly on foodstuffs. There was the Great Leap Forward in 1958, which was the second set of the five-year sets that they were doing. So he set targets, but they were really impossible to hit. People would have to make steel by destroying farm tools that they needed for other things in order to meet the quotas. Uh, still, the Great Leap Forward killed about 20 to 40 million people, it's estimated, by famine. And the GDP fell by 25%. So this scheme really did not work at all. In 1961, no matter if the cat is black or white, it does not matter if it catches mice, was a quote. From Deng, somebody named Deng, meaning that production matter doesn't matter if it's capitalist production, doesn't matter if it's communist production. The idea is how many units did we produce? What was our basically contribution margin? How profitable is it? Doesn't matter what the ideas are behind it. You know, it doesn't matter. But Mao really hated this. Um, and started the Cultural Revolution based on 16 points. Now, here's a note. Although the bourgeoisie had been dethroned, they were still trying to regain power in order to coerce and enslave many people. A quote from Mao, the more people you kill, the better dictator you are. Oh, man. I'll read that again from Mao. The more people you kill, the better dictator you are. There was a disruptive opportunity when Mao died. It was leaving a you know huge power vacuum. The gang of four was Mao's wife and some other women. Some wanted to abandon the Cultural Revolution, so there was a push to return to the two whatevers, Wong argued, and to do all that Mao said. Also, there's someone named Peng who didn't want capitalism. So he did say that there could be some better ways to create growth that would give some inclusive institutions, but that would not threaten the elites. So now you're really seeing these political people try to balance the commoners against the elites. They wanted to get rid of Mao. They wanted to get rid of some of his institutions. They also wanted to get rid of classes. They wanted to give property rights. They wanted to induce, introduce foreign investments. Well, eventually, Wa Wa Feng sets a coup against the Gang of Four and puts Deng in power. So Deng encouraged public mockery of Mao's ideas. He attacked the two whatevers, i.e. whatever Mao said and whatever Mao did. That's the two whatevers. Huh. So he, man, really interesting. So they tried the household responsibility system to replace the old communist agricultural system. But Deng got rid of many of the old politicians and also brought in new people. And so now it seemed that Deng had consummated this revolution that they were having. The mandatory selling of grain was abandoned in 1985. In the urban economy, they made 14 open cities that were allowed to have foreign invest investment. Grain output was higher with less people working in these jobs. Very interesting. Chapter 15, Understanding Prosperity and Poverty. It says that there are huge differences in standards of living worldwide, some superior to the vast mass of many people in many parts of the Americas and in Africa. Two non-class examples. Uh, prior to the 19th century, it looks like that the Mexican side was much richer maybe than the American side. Also, you have North and South Korea that you can compare to each other. Most of the big changes have occurred over the last 200 years. So they say, what drives this? What, what in the last 200 years is really driving these big changes? Ethnic differences, cultural differences, geography. Basically, they ask, you know, what was it? Was it inevitable for the British to go through the Industrial Revolution? I mean, was that like fated by God? And that, you know, all the colonies and all the colonizing that Britain would do? I mean, was that just part of how it's supposed to be? Or can we explain it? What about Peru? What about the slaves? You know, what effect did all of this have? Slavery, I mean, on uh, nations being able to develop. They basically say we needed a, a theory of how to understand this complex phenomenon. 
there is of course a multi cause and effect kind of answer that we could we could look at and they've talked about their theory at, at this point in the book they made it pretty clear they they go back and they reiterate, reiterate peru is poor today because of their institutions the incas were more advanced than the societies in north america but the way it was colonized made a big difference for their future and three pack factors were very important i only list two here one that north america followed a different path because they couldn't find enough slaves basically to just capture and have the slaves do everything that they needed done in but two by comparison in peru the spanish conquistadors found a large population who could be conscripted or whom could be conscripted for labor and that was the big difference how can we understand the european colonizers uh, of the world compared to china or how can we understand that feudalism maybe was a replaced slavery but still had some some of the same elements of slavery what about in china you know the, the rise of independent cities or even in you know europe the rise of independent city states think about the monarchs the monarchs Hmm. Other observations from the book you have inclusion and extraction are basically self-reinforcing. You know, nations that have achieved almost no central government like Afghanistan or the collapse of the state like Haiti even before the 2010 earthquake, you know, are unlikely to really progress very far. You need some central guidance, you need some someone to set standardized currency, standardized laws, something that everyone can agree upon. Even maybe some of that stuff we've talked about before about like in uh, Botswana, like a national identity, a national language, something to unify people. Burundi, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Rwanda. These are all nations among other nations that have centralized, although Tanzania is a bit behind the others. So they've made some progress, but you know, it's to differing degrees. Chile has even reached some pluralism. Since Colombia does not have pluralism, it's unlikely that they will become prosperous, is what the authors argue. It is also unlikely that the Chinese will be able to maintain their previous levels of economic growth. They say transitioning from one you know, system to another is not easy. The vicious circle can continue if some policies change, as we saw with the iron oligarchy in Chapter 12. In Egypt, you know, it's really not clear whether Mubarak uh, will be able to make changes in the Egyptian society. The book helps give policy advice and how to help governments avoid mistakes. There's always this irresistible charm of economic growth, like we saw in China in the 1990s. The businessmen thought that the three building boom would continue into the 2000s. You know, they tell a story about how this one businessman met with bosses to expand a steel company, but the company was shut down by the government and he was arrested. And he spent five years on house arrest for making a company that would compete with the government's companies. So entrepreneurs are not really accepted. I mean, not in the normal sense that we would think of like in capitalist society. I mean, threatening a, a major industry leader is not, you know, a crime in, in, in the West, in Europe, in, in America. It's whoever can produce the best product, right? Uh, but they use the image of a caged bird, that the cage must be made bigger so that the bird can grow, but the cage cannot be removed for the bird could fly away, and they didn't want that. So private entrepreneurs were met with suspicion. In China, there are many private companies that are doing well. However, at every private company, there is a red phone in the CEO's office, which is linked to the state. And if the government call uh, calls the company, I mean, they have to do whatever the government says. This is interesting for investors if you're talking about like Neo is a real interesting uh, electric car company out of China, and many people in America are you know young investors are excited about this company, but other people are always saying hold on you know this isn't this isn't like an American company this is owned by the state and some people say that's good and other people say no that's not good, so what we know is China has cheap labor they have a huge amount of people and they have cheap labor uh, that China's growth is based on taking old technology and adding capital in order to make it quicker quicker uh, able to meet demand. They're still not really innovating or coming up with unique products. They're copying other products. They're, you know, making replicas. They're reverse engineering things. So it's a different, you know, you have to have a different mindset. To create something new is different to copy something they already made. Yu Xiaobo won the Nobel Prize for Peace and is in prison for criticizing the communist government. Somehow the Chinese government was able to block stories on the New York Times and the Financial Times. So the authors say that the growth will be limited in China unless they allow entrepreneurs to really be free, to actually be free. 
The import of foreign technology and the export of low-tech man low tech manufacturing. Once China reaches the standards of living uh, levels for like an average country, it will see a huge slowdown in China. Lipson, famous for a theory of modernization, that all nations over time will modernize and become more democratic. Well, what about Iraq? I mean, it was not the poorest, and it had an educated government. You know, they say that the modernization theory is really false, and that it's misleading because it does not understand the importance in institutions operating, whether extractive or inclusive, on both political and economic levels. So you could, you know, you could ha you could be very rich because you have a you have an oil resource, right? Or you could have a trade industry or something like this. Um, although I think I think oil is really really interesting um, commodity because Venezuela, other places, Iran, Iraq. Um, anyways, we can see that not all nations are becoming more democratic. Rather, we can see that you know d democracy actually is kind of seen as a threat. And they kill it if they can in some nations, like in Venezuela, in Colombia. So it's not always seen as a great thing. Not everybody loves this idea of shared power, especially if you're from an elite ruling class. Um, Rwanda was an interesting example. You know, we talked about that before, too. So Germany and Japan had one of the highest standards of living in the 1900s, yet they came to have socialism in Germany and military rule in Japan by the middle of the 1940s. In chapter 11, we saw how democratically elected leaders can act like dictators. Remember Argentina, who took 75% of the people's wealth through like a change in currency. Authoritarian growth is not usually good. There are times that the powerful want to see innovation, but then again, they can always change their mind. So over the long term, they'll become threatened and they will not like innovation at some power at some point because of the, the sharing of power that it, it causes. There's a quote in chapter 15. It says, you can't engineer prosperity. What is the ignorance hypothesis? It's, if people are left uneducated, then educating people will fix the problem and it will help the leaders. Well, Kofi Busia in chapter 2, the prime minister of Ghana in the 1970s, was not the ignorant leader. I mean, out there making bad choices, but rather certain economic forces were things that like he was facing as a leader. This is like the U.S. who makes way too many rules. The IMF, they try to get poor countries to implement certain policies and macroeconomic goals, small government spending, flexible exchange rates, and also like prime terms, like private property, or sorry, like private, private terms, like private property, anti-corruption measures. The author says that these are actually sensible, but they fail to understand the constraints on policy if they do not or cannot explain the reasons why leaders are knowingly hurting their own economies or knowingly hurting some sectors or some of their people. Basically, they argue, you know, people are not ignorant. Leaders are not ignorant. Like, this is not a bunch of uneducated people that, that can't really see what they're up to and what they're doing. They're going to argue, no, people understand what they're doing. They're incentivized to take advantage and marginalize some in their society. There are always paths for central bank independence. They were spending more than they were receiving in taxes, so they forced their central bank to print money to make up the difference. A man in 1995 in Zimbabwe decided to make the central bank independent, but the central bank being independent had inflation go from 25% to 26,000% in the coming years. So this is very problematic, as they, um, they even killed people who did not follow the orders. So in both countries that they looked at, the central banks printed more than when um, they were like state ruled. So basically when they became independent, we saw that they printed a lot more money. So maybe you want some controls is what they're saying. There's another theory. It's a theory of failure of micro markets. Basically economists think that they can fix these. Like if there's simple problems in like healthcare or whatever, you just focus on those areas. These authors agree to some degree, but they say that these aren't really the root causes. You know, inefficiencies, the lack of certain products or services in an environment or in a society. They say, obviously, this is not their thesis. They say it's not micro or macroeconomic factors. It's this other thing. What about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? Uh, the U.S. topples the old government. They put in Hamid Karzai. 
they apparently didn't, you know, they didn't want the Taliban, they didn't like the Taliban, so the international community, uh, through large injections of, like, aid, should get the economy going. They thought, you know, that'll probably work, but it didn't work. A lot of aid workers showed up, each with their own agenda. Billions of dollars were flowing into Afghanistan. But not much money went to roads or schools. Most of the money went to creating an airline so that the bureaucrat could go from town to town, um, and along with their translators. So it wasn't really helping the normal person. It wasn't like helping you know, the economy become stronger. There was talk of a big project, but the villagers could not use the materials they got. 20% of the money was taken as head office costs for like uh, the United Nations in Geneva. Another 20% went to the NGO office that was given the contract. Most of the money went to private trucking companies, actually. So most studies say that only 10 to 20% of the money goes to the people. Sometimes it's fraud, but sometimes it is merely from incompetence. Sometimes it went to government, me government leaders like Mbutu in Congo, who wanted to make sure that his leadership would be, be protected, you know? And that kind of makes sense. I mean, I think that self-preservation, that makes sense. Foreign aid is one of the most... Uh, popular government policies despite its bad track record. The failure of foreign aid continues to be proven false over and over again. It's based on an incorrect understanding of poverty. Usually the problem is the elite take it or it doesn't go to where it's supposed to go. If sustained economic growth requires inclusive institutions, then, the, then logically it is not possible to see economic growth by giving money to fund extractive organizations. So sometimes the aid is given with conditions as well, like the Millennium Challenge accounts means that aid is given if targets are hit and if certain imp like policies are implemented. But this doesn't seem to have any significant effect on the real change of the heart and soul of institutions. It says even after the Millennial Challenge accounts have kind of taken place. So they say the use of foreign aid doesn't really work. They say that foreign aid helps rich people deal with their guilt or concern for others. They would feel even more guilty if they didn't give, even if the system is extremely inefficient. What other option is there for people um, is something that, that might be argued, right? So they say foreign aid will not create sustained growth. Empowerment, in quotes, however, from chapter 15-12 in Brazil, um, it was illegal to strike since 1964, since the military overthrew the democratically elected government. The government had been fixing the inflation, which underestimated the real level of inflation in the cost of goods. There was an activist, and he refused to work, actually. The resurgence of the Brazilian labor movement occurred. Later, some thinkers wanted the, quote-unquote, reactivation of society. The churches, the labor groups, the businesses needed to link arms and make a democratic organization. They begin to have some elections. There were like new parties, like the Workers' Party in the 1980s. Workers' Party was in power for about 30 years. There was an expansion in education. It is the first Latin American country to have weight in international circles in brick exports. Okay, The Brazilian transformation began by building inclusive institutions. And how can you build these? Or how can you get rid of the old ones? Well, again, we got to go back. Think about the Glorious Revolution in England, 1688, France, the French Revolution, uh, 1789, in Japan, the Maji Revolution, 1868. All of these had political revolutions, and some of them were bloody. I mean, they can be very bloody. The Bolshevik Revolution of Russia promised to give people more representation, but the outcome was actually the opposite. It was actually more authoritative. And the same was true in Vietnam, same was true in Cuba. But this also happens in non-communist countries, like we talked about. We talked about in Egypt, after Nasser, you had Hosni Mubarak's corrupt regime. Or in Rhodesia, you had Robert Mugabe. He was seen as a freedom fighter, you know, ousting Ian Smith. But when Mugabe ruled Zimbabwe, I mean, he became just as oppressive, just as dictatorial, uh, and the country did, I mean, just as poorly. In North America and Botswana, so both of those were English colonies at one point, a large swath of society rather than concentrating power within the elite. Now, in the case of the Glorious Revolution, there was a broad coalition of aristocracy, um, not like joining up with the crown. Uh, and there was many other people that were opposed to the crown, merchants and, and things of this nature, so many people in society. And this gave their cause popular support. And England would not become a true democracy for another 200 years. So it takes a long time. Empowerment uh, at the grassroots level in Brazil helped create the emergence of a government that cared about public services, education, and the like. But the Brazilian experience was much better than Venezuela, 
who transitioned to a quote-unquote democracy in the 1950s. Well, people would even vote for despots like you know, Hugo Chavez, since they thought it was only a strong man who could stand up for the challenges facing their country. You know, it kind of ends and it really says that there's, oh, a couple more statements. There's no clear formula for making the transition to pluralism, but that some things would help. Communication, some civil society movements that can stand up and advocate for social problems and political thinkers. And, you know, they say the process is slow, but the transition is not well understood. The other thing is that it's important to involve media. The openness to inform the public, so honest, unrestricted media, right? Um, some of the things that helped Iranians stand up to the fraudulent uh, election of uh, Mohammad Ahmadinejad in 2009 were anonymous blogs, Facebook, and things like that. And one thing is interesting, I think, to put it in our present context, all the doxing, right? People on Facebook, people on YouTube, um, you know, certain channels being taken down because of their political comments. You know, that really the corporates, we see this now, right? And this is why people are concerned. And even this is why I think this is the thing behind some of the stuff with the refusal to wear masks. I don't think that there's that many people, at least where I live, um, that, you know, have any anything to say that, oh, you know, um, we're not in the middle of a pandemic. I think everybody believes the science side of it. Uh, maybe there's some debate upon the severity, but everyone knows that this is a real thing. People are getting sick. People are going to the hospital. But people are, are, are you know, what they're concerned about, in one sense, is the... The giving up of power of the people, when to go out, when they can open their business, when they can't, um, what they can say on the internet, what they can't, um, and even to have like the ability to decide if they're going to, you know, risk their health to a certain degree in order to earn a paycheck. You know, there's many people in mining and all kinds of the trades. It's dangerous. This is how people make their money. There are risks involved. Finally, Fujimura in Peru makes false election and therefore a false regime based on bribes. They uh, controlled the bribes and they kept track of how much it cost. The accomplices were on record actually. Eventually these notes, this information was given to journalists. The Supreme Court judges were worth $5,000 to $10,000 per month, but the control of the TV stations were worth millions. That's very interesting. And kind of to my point, newspapers were paid $3,000 to $5,000 to run a, a headline, a certain headline. They said, if we do not control the television, we do not control anything. China has a frighteningly sophisticated system of media control. To uphold the leadership of the party, the party must control the news, the military, and the cadres, which are a small part of the people uh, that have specific purposes. The role of media should be to help create more inclusive institutions, and these are the authors, Darren Ace. Moglu and James Robinson. Again, this is the, uh, the book is called uh, Why Nations Fail. And that's kind of how it ends, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Another book we're going to look at, which is, uh, goes, goes deeper, goes real deep into China is called, uh, I think it's called China. And it's got this oxymoronic title, A Fragile Superpower. And it talks a lot about, you know, the ruling elite in China, how they came after Mao, um, how they want to censor ideas, they want to control things. They are way outnumbered by all the people who live in China. Um, and they have to set up a lot of systems of controls in order to basically temper their own fear of being overthrown violently or whatever. Um, and so it's a big juggling act on their part. We'll look at that in the future. Thanks so much for joining me on this one. We'll talk to you next time. Please like, subscribe. You're welcome. We do a lot of uh, things like stock market investing. Um, how to build a stock portfolio. Uh, we're doing a lot of the other FSOT books as well. So hope you guys enjoy. Best to everyone.